Well, good evening. How's your summer going? Tell me all the fun things you're doing. You make it to the lake yet? Been doing any fishing? I hope so. Now the kids are out of school. I hope you're having fun with them and showing some good things to them. I see a couple of you have brought some kids with you tonight. That's always fun to see. This could be their first campfire. I hope it's uh, not their last. You know, it's good to see them. It's good to see you. Now, tonight, I want to tell you some more of that story by Max Brand, The Untamed. You know, we're in book two. I, I hear there's a book three if we ever get there, but we got chapters 30, 31, 32 tonight. And it's getting so darn good. You know what's coming. Black Bart, Dan, and Satan are going to go after the bad guys. Her father lay propped high with pillows among which his head lolled back. The only light in the room was near the bed and it cast a glow upon the face of Joe Cumberland and on the white linen, the white hair, the white pointed beard. All the rest of the room swam in darkness. The chairs were blotches, indistinct, uncertain. Even the foot of the bed trailed off to nothingness. It was like one of those impressionistic, very modern paintings. You know, where the artist centers upon one point and throws the rest of his canvas into dull oblivion. The focus here was the face of the old cattleman. The bedclothes, never stirred, lay in folds sharply cut out with black shadows and they had a solid seeming as, as the mort cloth rendered in marble over the effigy. That suggested weight exaggerated the frailty of the body beneath the clothes. Exhausted by that burden, the old man lay in the arms of a deadly languor, so that there was a kinship of more than blood between him and Kate at that moment. She stepped to the side of the bed and stood staring down at him, and there was little gentleness in her expression. So cold was that settled gaze that her father stirred, at length shivered, and without opening his eyes, fumbled at the bedspread and drew it in a little more closely about his shoulders. Even that did not give him rest. And presently, the wrinkled eyelids opened and he looked up at his daughter. A film of weariness, heavier than sleep at first obscured his sight. But this in turn cleared away. He frowned a little to clear his vision. Then he wagged his head slowly from side to side. Kate, he said feebly, I done my best. It simply wasn't good enough. She answered in a voice as low as his, but steadier. What could have happened? Dad, what happened to make you give up every hold on Dan? What was it? You were the last power that could keep him here. You knew it. Why did you tell him he could go? The monotone was more deadly than any emphasis of a raised voice. If you'd been here, pleaded Joe Cumberland, you'd have done what I'd done. I couldn't help it. There he sat on the foot of the bed. See where them covers still kind of sagged down. After he told me that he had something to do away from the ranch and that he wanted to go now, that Black Bart was well enough to travel in short spells. He asked me if I still needed him. And you told him no, she cried. Oh, Dad, you know it means everything to me, but you told him no. He raised a shaking hand to ward off the outburst and to stop it. Not at first, honey. Give me a chance to talk, Kate. At first, I told him that I needed him. And God knows that I do need him. I, I don't know why. Not even Doc Byron knows what there is about Dan that helps me. I told Dan all them things. And he didn't say nothing, but just sat still on the foot of the bed and he looked at me. It ain't easy to bear his eyes, Kate. I lay here and I tried at first to smile at him and talk about other things, but it ain't easy to bear his eyes. You take a dog, Kate. It ain't supposed to be able to look you in the eye for long. But suppose you met up with a dog that could. It'd make you feel sort of weird inside, which I felt that way while Dan was looking at me. Not that he was threatening me. No, no it wasn't that. He was only thoughtful, but I kept getting more nervous and more fidgety. I felt after a while like I couldn't stand it. I had to crawl out of bed and begin walking up and down till I got quieter. But I seen that wouldn't do. 
Then I began to think. A thought of near everything in a little while. I thought of what, what would happen. Suppose Dan should stay here. Maybe you and him would get to like each other again. Maybe you'd get married. Then what would happen? I thought of the wild geese flying north in the spring of the year, and the wild geese flying south in the fall of the year, and I thought of Dan with his heart following the wild geese. God knows why. And I seen a picture of him standing and watching them, with you nearby and not able to get one look out of him. I seen that, and it made my blood chilly like the air on a frosty night. Kate, there's something like the power of prophecy that comes to a dying man. Dad, she cried, what are you saying? She slipped to her knees beside the bed and drew his cold hands toward her. But Joe Cumberland shook his head and mildly drew one hand away. He raised it with extended forefinger, a sign of an infinite warning. And with the glow of the lamp full upon his face, the eyes were pits of shadow with stirring orbs of fire in the depths. No, I ain't dead now, he said. But I ain't far from it. Maybe days, maybe weeks, maybe whole months. But I've passed the top of the hill, and I know I'm riding down the slope. And pretty soon I'll finish the trail. But what little time I've got left is worth more than everything that went before. I can see my life behind me, and the things before like a cold morning light was over it all. You know, before the sun begins to beat up the waves of heat and the mist gets tangling in front of your eyes. You know, when you can look right across a 30-mile valley and name the trees almost to the other side. That's the way I can see right now. There ain't no feeling about it. My body is all plumb paralyzed. I just see and know, that's all. And what I see of you and Dan, if you ever marry, is plain hell. Love ain't the only thing they is between a man and a woman. They something else. I don't know what it is, but it's sort of a common purpose. It's having both pairs of feet stepping out on the same path. That's what it is. But your trail would go one way and Dan's would go another. And pretty soon your love wouldn't be nothing but a big wind blowing between two mountains. And all it would do would be to freeze up the blood in your hearts. I seen all that while Dan was sitting at the foot of the bed. Not that I don't want him here. When I see him, I see the world the way it was when I was under 30, when there wasn't nothing I wouldn't try once, when all I wanted was a gun and a hoss and a song to keep me from trading with kings. No, it ain't going to be easy for me when Dan goes away. But what's my tag end of life compared with yours? You got to be given a chance. You got to be kept away from Dan. And that's why I told him, finally, that I thought I could get along without him. Whether or not you saved me, she answered, you signed a death warrant for at least two men when you told him that. Two men? There's only one he's after, and Buck Daniel has had a long start. He can't be caught. Well, that Marshal Calkins is here tonight. He saw Buck at Rafferty's, and he talked about it in the hearing of Dan at the table. I watched Dan's face. You may read the past and see the future, Dad, but I know Dan's face. I can read it as the sailor reads the seas. Before tomorrow night, Buck Daniels will be dead, and Dan's hands will be red. She dropped her head against the bedclothes, clasped her fingers over the bright hair. When she could speak again, she raised her head and went on in the same swift, low monotone. And besides, Black Bart has found the trail of the man who fired the barn and shot him. And the body of Buck won't be cold before Dan will be on the heels of that other man. Oh, Dad, two lives lay in the hollow of your hand. You could have saved them by merely asking Dan to stay with you. But you've thrown him away. Buck Daniels, repeated the old man, the horror of the thing dawning on him, only slowly. Why didn't he get farther away? Why didn't he ride night and day after he left us? He got to be warned that Dan is coming. I thought of that. I'm going into my room now to write a note and send it to Buck by one of our men. But at the most he'll have less than a day's start. And what is a day to Satan and Dan Barry? I thought it was for the best, muttered old Joe. 
I couldn't see how it was wrong. But I can send for Dan and tell him I changed my mind. He broke off in a groan. Oh, that wouldn't be good. He set his mind on going by this time and nothing can keep him back. But Kate, maybe I can delay him. Has he gone up to his room yet? He's in there now. Talk softly or he'll hear us. He's walking up and down now. Ay, 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 nodded old Joe, his eyes widening with horror. And his footfall is like the padding of a big cat. I could tell it out of a thousand steps, and I know what's going on inside his mind. Yes, yes, he's thinking of how that blow Buck Daniel struck him. He's thinking of the man who shot down Bart. God save them both. Listen, whispered the cattleman. He's raised the window. I've heard the rattle of the weights. He's standing there in front of the window, letting the wind of the night blow in his face. The wind from the window, indeed, struck across the door, communicating with Joe Cumberland's room, and shook it as if a hand were rattling at the knob. The girl began to speak again as swiftly as before, her voice the barely audible rushing of a whisper. The law will trail him, but I won't give him up, Dad. I'm going to fight once more to keep him here. And if I fail, I'll follow him around the world. Such words should have come loudly and ringing, but spoken so softly, they gave a terrible effect, like the ravings of delirium or the monotone of insanity. And with the white light against her face, she was more awe-aspiring and beautiful. He loved me once, and the fire must still be in him. Such fire can't go out. I'll fan it back to life. Then if it burns me, if it burns us both, the fire cannot be more torture than to live on like this. Hush, lass. Listen to what's coming. It was a moan, very low-pitched, and then rising slowly and gaining in volume, rising up the scale with a dizzy speed till it burst and rang through the house. The long-drawn wail of a wolf when it hunts on a fresh trail. Chapter 31, The Message Buck Daniels opened his eyes and sat bolt upright in bed. He had dreamed the dream again, and this time, as always, he awakened right before the end. He needed no rubbing of eyes to rouse his senses. If a shower of cold water had been dashed upon him, he could not have rallied from sound slumber so suddenly. His first movement was to snatch his gun from under the mattress. Not that he dreamed of needing it, but for some reason the pressure of the butt against the palm was reassuring. It was better than the grip of his friend, a strong man. It was the first gray of dawn, a light so feeble that it served merely to illuminate the darkness, so to speak. It fell with any power upon one thing alone, the bit of an old dusty bridle that hung against the wall, and it made the steel glitter like a watchful eye. There was a great dryness in the throat of Buck Daniels, and his whole big body shook with the pounding of his heart. He was not the only thing that was awake in this gray hour, for now he caught a faint and regular creaking of the stairs. Someone was mounting with an excessively cautious and patient step. For usually the crazy stairs that led up to the garret room of the Rafferty house creaked and groaned to protest at every footfall. But now the footfall paused at the head of the stairs as when one stops to listen. Buck Daniels raised his revolver and leveled it on the door but his hand was shaken so terribly that he could not keep his aim. The muzzle kept veering back and forth across the door. He seized his right hand with his left hand and crushed it with a desperate pressure, and it was a bit better. The quivering of the two hands counteracted each other, and he managed to keep some sort of a bead. Now the step continued again down the short hall. A hand fell on the knob of the door and pressed it slowly down. Against the deeper blackness of the hall beyond, Buck saw a tall figure, hatless. His finger curved around the trigger, 
and still he did not fire. Even to his hysterical brain, it occurred that Dan Barry would be wearing a hat. And moreover, this, this form was tall. Buck, came a guarded voice. The muzzle of Daniel's revolver dropped, and he threw the gun on his bed and stood up. Jim Rafferty, he cried. It was something like a groan in his voice. What in the name of God are you doing here at this hour? Someone come here and banged on the door a while ago. Had a letter for you. Must have rid a long ways and come fast. While he was giving me the letter at the door, I heard his hoss a panting outside. He wouldn't stay. He went right back. Now here's the letter, Buck. Hope it ain't no bad news. You got a light here, ain't you? All right, Jim, answered Buck Daniels, taking the letter. I got a lantern. You get back to bed. The other replied with a noisy yawn and left the room while Buck kindled the lantern, and by that light he read his name upon the envelope and tore it open. It was very brief. Dear Buck, Last night at supper, Dan found out where you are. In the morning, he's leaving the ranch, and we know that he intends to ride for Rafferty's place. He'll probably be there before noon. The moment you get this, you saddle your horse and you ride. Oh, Buck, why did you stay so close to us? Relay your horses. Don't stop until you're over the mountains. Black Bart's well enough to take the trail, and Dan will use him to follow you. You know what that means. Ride, ride, ride. Kate. He crumpled up the paper and he sank back upon the bed. Why did you stay so close? He had wondered at that himself many times in the past few days. Like the hunted rabbit, he expected to find safety under the very nose of danger. And now that he was discovered... It seemed incredible that he could have followed so patently foolish a course. In a sort of a daze, he uncrumpled the note again and read the wrinkled writing word by word. He had leaned close to read it by the uncertain light, and now he caught the faintest breath of perfume from the paper. It was a small thing, smaller among scents than a whisper is among voices but it made Buck Daniels drop his head and crush the paper against his face. It was a moment before he could uncrumple that paper sufficiently to study the contents of the note thoroughly. At first, his dazed brain caught only part of the significance. Well, then it dawned on him that the girl thought he had fled from the Cumberland Ranch through fear of Dan Barry. Ah, there'd been fear in it. Every day at the ranch he had shuddered at the thought that the destroyer might ride up on that devil of black silk and gray Satan. But every day he had convinced himself that even then Dan Barry remembered the past and was cursing himself for the ingratitude he had shown his old friend. Now the truth swept coldly home to Buck Daniels. Barry was as fierce as ever upon the trail, and Kate Cumberland thought that he, Buck Daniels, had fled like a cur from danger. He seized his head between his hands and beat his knuckles against the corrugated flesh of his forehead. She had thought that. Desire for action, 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 beset him like a thirst. To close with this devil, this wolf man, to set his big fingers in the smooth, almost girlish throat, to choke the yellow light out of those eyes, or else to die but like a man proving his manhood before the girl. He read the letter again, and then in an agony he crumpled it to a ball and hurled it across the room. Catching up his hat and his belt, he rushed wildly from the room, thundered down the crazy stairs and out to the stable. Long Bess, the tall bay mare which had carried him through three years of adventure and danger and never failed him yet raised her aristocratic head above the side of the stall and whinnied. For answer, he shook his fist at her and cursed insanely. The saddle he jerked by one stirrup leather from the wall and flung it on her back. And when she cringed to the far side of the stall, he cursed her again, bitterly, and drew up the cinch with a lunge that made her groan. He did not wait to lead her to the door before mounting, but sprang into the saddle. Here he whirled her about and drove home the spurs, 
cruel usage for Long Bess had never denied him the utmost of her speed and strength at just the mere sound of his voice. Now, half mad with fear and surprise, she sprang forward at full gallop, slipped and almost sprawled on the floor, and then thundered out of the door. At once, the soft, sandy soil received the deadened impact of her hooves. Off she flew through the gray of the morning, soundless as a racing ghost. Long Bess, there was good blood in her. She was as delicately limbed as an antelope, and her heart was as strong as the smooth muscles of her shoulders and her hips. Yet to Buck Daniels, her fastest gait seemed slower than a walk. Already his thoughts were flying far before. Already he stood before the ranch house calling to Dan Barry. Aye, at the very door of the place where he should meet, and one of them must die. And better by far that the blood of him who died should stain the hands of Kate Cumberland. This is chapter 32, Victory. The gray light which Buck Daniels saw that morning hardly brightened as the day grew, for the sky was overcast with sheeted mist, and through it a dull evening radiance filtered to the earth. Wung Lu, his celestial oriental eyes now yellow with cold, built a fire on the big hearth in the living room. It was a roar and blaze, for the wood was so dry that it flamed as though soaked in oil and tumbled a mass of yellow fire up the chimney. So bright was the fire, indeed, that its light quite overshadowed the meager day which looked in on the window, and every chair cast its shadow away from the hearth. Later on, Kate Cumberland came down the back stairs and slipped on into the kitchen. "'Have you seen Dan?' she asked of the cook. "'Wong Lu make nice fire,' grinned the Chinese. "'Mr. Dan is there,' she thought for an instant." Is breakfast ready, Wong? Pretty soon, quick, nodded Wong Lu. Then throw out the coffee or the eggs, she said quickly. I don't want breakfast served yet. Wait till I send you word. As the door closed behind her, the eyebrows of Wong rose into perfect Roman arches. Huh, grunted Wong Lu. Oh, huh. In the hall, Kate met Randall Byron coming down the stairs. He was dressed in white, and he had found a little yellow wildflower and stuck it in his buttonhole. He seemed ten years younger than the day he rode with her to the ranch, and now he came to her with a quick step, a smiling. Dr. Byron, she said quietly, breakfast will be late this morning. Also, I want no one to go into the living room for a while. Will you keep them out? The doctor was instantly gone. He hasn't gone yet, he queried. Not yet. The doctor sighed, and then apparently following a sudden impulse, he reached his hand to her. I hope something comes of it, he said. Even then, she could not help a wan smile. What do you mean by that, doctor? The doctor sighed again. If the inference is not clear, he said, I'm afraid that I cannot explain. But I'll try to keep everyone from the room. She nodded her thanks and went on. But passing the mirror in the hall, the sight of her face made her stop abruptly. There was no vestige of color in it, and the shadow beneath her eyes made them seem inhumanly large and deep. The bright hair, to be sure, waved over her head and coiled on her neck, but it was like a futile shaft of sunlight falling on a dreary moor in the winter. She went on thoughtfully to the door of the living room, but there she paused again, and while she stood there, she remembered herself as she had been only a few months before. With the color flushing in her face, the continual light in her eyes, there had been little need for thinking then. One had only to let the wind and the sun strike on one and live. Then, in a quiet despair, she said to herself, As I am, I must win or lose, as I am. And she opened the door and she stepped inside. She had been cold with fear and excitement when she entered the room to make her last stand for happiness. But once she was in, it was not so hard. Dan Barry lay on the couch at the far end of the room with his hands thrown under his head, and he was smiling in a way which she knew well. It had been a danger signal in the old days, and when he turned his face said good morning to her, 
She caught that singular glimmer of yellow, which sometimes came up behind his eyes. In reply to his greeting, she merely nodded, then walked slowly to the window and turned her back to him. It was a one-tone landscape. Sky, hills, barn, earth, all was a single mass of lifeless gray. In such an atmosphere, old Homer had seen the rites of his dead heroes play again at the things that they had done on earth. She noted these things with a blank eye, for a thousand thoughts were leaping through her mind. Something must be done. There he lay in the same room with her. He had turned his head back, no doubt, and was staring at the ceiling as before, and the yellow glimmer in his eyes again. Perhaps after this day, she should never see him again. Every moment was precious, beyond the price of gold, and yet there she stood at the window doing nothing. But what could she do? Should she go to him and fall on her knees beside him and pour out her heart, telling him again of the old days? No, it would be like striking on a wooden bell, no echo would rise, and she knew beforehand the deadly blackness of his eyes. So Black Bart lay often in the sun, staring at infinite distance and seeing nothing but his dreams of battle. What were appeals and what were words to Black Bart? What were they to Dan Barry? Yet once, by sitting still, the thought made her blood leap with a great joyous pulse that set her cheeks a-tingling. She waited until the first impulse of excitement had subsided, and then she turned back and sat down in a chair near the fire. From the corner of her eye, she was aware that Whistling Dan had turned his head again to wait for her first speech. Then she fixed her gaze on the wall of yellow flame. The impulse to speak to him was like a hand tugging to turn her around, and the words came up and swelled in her throat, but still she would not stir. In a moment of rationality, she felt in an overwhelming wave of mental coldness the folly of her course. But she shut out that thought with a slight shudder. Silence to Dan Barry had a louder voice and more meaning than any words. Then she knew that he was sitting up on the couch. Was he about to stand up and walk out of the room? For moment after moment, he did not stir. And at length, she knew with a breathless certainty that he was staring fixedly at her. The hand, which was farthest from him and hidden, she gripped hard upon the arm of the chair. That was some comfort, some added strength. She had now the same emotion she had when Black Bart sunk towards her under the tree. If a single perceptible tremor shook her, if she showed the slightest awareness of the subtle approach, she was undone. It was only her apparent unconsciousness which could draw either the dog or the master. She remembered what her father had told her of hunting young deer, how he had lain in the grass and thrust up a leg above the grass in sight of the deer, and how they would first run away, but finally come back step by step, drawn by an invincible curiosity, until at length they were within range for a point-blank shot. Now she must concentrate on the flames of the fireplace, see nothing but them, think nothing but the swiftly changing domes and walls and pinnacles they made. She leaned a little forward, rested her cheek upon her right hand, and thereby she shut out the sight of Dan Barry effectually. Also, it made a brace to keep her from turning her head towards him, and she needed every support, physical and mental. Still... He did not move. Was he in truth looking at her, or was he staring behind her at the gray sky which lowered past the window? The faintest creaking sound told her that he had risen, slowly, from the couch. Then, not a sound, except that she knew in some mysterious manner that he had moved, but whether towards her or towards the door, she could not dream. But he had stepped suddenly and noiselessly, into the range of her vision and sat down on a low bench at one side of the hearth. If the strain had been tense before, it had now become terrible. For there he sat almost facing her and looking quite intently at her. 
yet she must keep all awareness of him out of her eyes. In the excitement, a strong pulse began to beat in the hollow of her throat, as if her heart was rising. She had won. She had kept him in the room. She had brought him to a keen thought of her. A fearic victory, for she was poised on the very edge of a cliff of hysteria. She began to feel a tremor of the hand which supported her cheek. If that should become visible to him, he would instantly know that all her apparent unconsciousness was a sham and that she would have lost him truly. Something sounded at one of the doors, and then the door opened softly. She was almost glad of the interruption, for another instant may have swept the last reserve of her strength. So this then was the end. But the footfall which sounded in the apartment was a soft padding step, a little scratching sound, light as a finger running on a frosty window pane, and then a long shaggy head slipped close to Whistling Dan. It was Black Bart. A wave of terror swept through her. She remembered another scene not many months before when Black Bart had drawn his master away from her and led him south, south, after the wild geese. The wolf dog had come again like a demonic spirit to undo her plans. Only an instant, the crisis of a battle. Then the great beast turned slowly, faced her, slunk with his long stride closer, and then a cold nose touched the hand which gripped the arm of her chair. It gave her a welcome excuse for action of some sort. She reached out her hand slowly and touched the forehead of Black Bart. He winced back. The long fangs flashed. Her hand remained tremulously poised in air, and then the long head approached again, cautiously, and once more she touched it. And since it did not stir, she trailed the tips of her fingers backwards towards the ears. Black Bart snarled again, but it was a sound so subdued as to be almost like the purring of a great cat. He sank down, and the weight of his head came upon her feet. Victory! In the full tide of conscious power, she was able to drop her hand from her face, raise her head, turn her glance carelessly upon Dan Barry. She was met by an ominously glowing eyes. Anger. At least it was not indifference. He rose and stepped in his noiseless way behind her, but he reappeared instantly on the other side and reached out his hand to where her fingers trailed limp from the arm of the chair. And there he let them lie, white and cool, against the darkness of his palm. It was as if he sought in the hand for the secret of her power over the wolf dog. She let her head rest against the back of the chair and watched the nervous and sinewy hand upon which her own rested. She had seen those hands fixed in the throat of Black Bart himself, once upon a time, a grim smile came to her. The tips of her fingers touched the paw of the panther. The steel-sharp claws were sheathed, but suppose once they were bared and clutched, or she stood touching a switch which might loose, by the slightest motion, a terrific voltage. What would happen? Nothing. Presently, the hand released her fingers, and Dan Barry stepped back and stood with folded arms, frowning at the fire. In the weakness which overcame her and the grip of the wild excitement, she dared not stay near him longer. She rose and walked into the dining room. Serve breakfast now, Wong, she commanded, and at once the gong was struck by the cook. Before the long vibrations had died away, the guests were gathering around the table, and the noisy marshal was the first to come. He slammed back a chair and sat down with a grunt of expectancy. "'Morning, Dan,' he said, wetting his knife across the tablecloth. "'I hear you're riding this morning. Ain't you going my way, are you?' Dan Barry sat frowning steadily down at the table. It was a moment before he answered. "'I ain't leaving,' he said softly at length. "'Postponed my trip.'" Well... There you are, folks. Now what's going to happen? Guess we'll have to see you next week, and we'll all find out together. That'd be good. 
Man, oh man, be careful out there, it's hot. A lot of people rolling around in this heat. If you can find a cool place to play in the water, why, well, that's the key. Say hi to everybody for me and I'll talk to you next time around. This is Clay Steele. Good night.